أقدم لك بخالص الشكر على الدعم وعلى أنا I'm going to say something in Arabic first and then we will and يعني الحقيقة معالي الوزير هو السبب في إن إحنا كلنا شعرنا بالدفء عندما تعاملنا معه وعندما عرضنا عليه وبعدين هي الفكرة اللي إحنا بنتكلم فيها إن إحنا بنحاول إن إحنا نعمل مبادرة بين الشعوب وليست بين الحكومات. ووجدنا ترحيب شديد جدا من معالي رئيس الوزراء لكن الحقيقة في التنفيذ لقينا معونة صادقة وعمل خلاق وأنا بأمل أن هذا المؤتمر سيعقد أيضا في أمريكا وأن احنا نستمر وبأمل أيضا أن كنت تعرفهم أن الميدل إيست انستيتيوت عبارة عن مرحبة وفاتحة صدرها لمصر وكمان بتؤمن أن تنمية مصر وتنمية الشباب وتنمية الكبار هو جزء من رسالتها اللي احنا هنقول عليها، ولذلك انا هستعرض بعض ال يعني عاوز برضو ما ننساش ان احنا هنقول شوية هوريكم شوية سلايد سريعة كده وبعدين اتفضل. ندير المعركة او ما سماها الثورة نديرها باسلوب علمي كبير جدا ودي محل اعجاب الناس كلها في الخيال لانه ابتدى يعمل دورات مياه ابتدى يعمل Everything was organized in a way that is amazing to the people outside. I got this slide from a friend of mine who thinks that this is a tremendous achievement for the people to be organizing itself. And we'll talk about if it, it is a the second one, is it the revolution or a coup? But I'm saying it is an evolution. It's not the only revolution, it's an evolution. Because the new political science or the new political stigma that we have. One of them is that people now can have their own determination. You can't say to them anything except this is the, the Latin Union when you see that the people decided and they win at the end of the day. Also, that gender inequality is changing. The equality is becoming a reality. And we have seen in the last election how the women have a strong power in getting in what we can call real equality. The third thing, they used to have our political differences to use it against us in our country. Like, for example, religion, right? But all this political didn't work at the present time because in 13th of June, that's what it looked like. The Muslim, the Christian, or even the non believers they all felt war and they felt that they are working for Egypt, not for anything else. This is a big change. The silent majority also started no longer to become silent. And this is a big change also. I want to say also our appearance here is part of joining you fighting terrorism. Because we feel that terrorism is not, has no religion, no place, no nation uh, you can belong to it, but terrorism is against the whole world. That's why defeating terrorism requires moving beyond borders, beyond security measures, beyond all this. We need to have new pillars to fight terrorism, not for Egypt, but for the whole world. And this mission is a new defeat for terrorism. Why I consider it a new defeat for terrorism? Because Terrorism doesn't want to have or they feel successful if they can stop you from your normal life. If they fail, this is the biggest achievement for the world and for Egypt. And I think as you see with all of us around, walking around in Egypt, it's a beautiful thing to say this is the new. We are coming to build the new places. This is the Middle East Institute business, health, education, and the culture. And the American Middle East Institute has been, has exceptional leadership in enhancing business. And that's why we are happy to have it. This initiative was called Pittsburgh is coming to you. So we're not going to waste your time. I'm going to stop here and say that we are grateful for those who attended today. We feel so grateful also for the people who came and joined us from the United States. And I thank all of you. And also my sincere uh, wishes for all the people to enjoy themselves, have the best, 
and also my gratitude to the minister who gave us a lot of his time and he had to and to the staff who has been with us and uh, your staff has been greatly uh, the work they're giving has been greatly appreciated especially Ella who helped us so thank you very much in Arabic uh, yes please just a few words <laughs> Pittsburgh دي زي مصر بالظبط كانت مدينة مليانة بلوشة مدينة ما فيهاش اقتصاد مدينة كانت في حالة سيئة جدا وإذا تتحول الأمور لتصير في مقدمة المدن مش الصناعية بس مدينة كمان عبارة عن مدينة كل الأديان وكل الكالتشرز ولكن في تقدم غير عادي من ناحية الإدوكيشن ومن ناحية البيزنس ومن كل النواحي أصبحت رائدة كان زمان الدخان بيغطي بيتسبرغ والمية اللي في اللي زي نهر النيل عندنا هم عندهم ستة نهار على صغننين كده لكن كان بلوتد that's why I feel احنا لازم نأخذ عبرة من بيتسبرغ وهي هتقول بقى بالإنجليزي تكلمكم على بيتسبرغ now you tell them that. Before we have the honor to listen to um, His Excellency uh, Minister Abdel Noor, um, I wanted to just uh, show you a brief video um, that has a few photographs of our city of Pittsburgh. And of course, you see it on the front cover of the red program. Um, we're very proud of Pittsburgh. It's an old city by American standards, not by Egyptian standards. And uh, it used to be the, it was called the Silicon Valley of the 19th century. There was so much happening in Pittsburgh. It was um, inventions coming together, everything going on there. And in, um, you'll hear in the video, it became such an industrial powerhouse that in the World War II, um, Pittsburgh created more steel than Germany and Japan combined. It was unbelievable, but also it became very polluted. And so you're gonna hear, hear from Bill Flanagan, who is an executive with the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. And he's going to tell you a little bit about the story of Pittsburgh, which is really a story of transformation. Because when their steel industry went away, Pittsburgh reinvented itself. And it became an expert, became a leader in technology, in health, in education, in energy. Oil was first discovered, actually, in Pittsburgh, the first commercial oil drill in uh, 1859. So without further ado, we're going to watch um, uh, just a very five-minute video about, by, um, about Pittsburgh. Okay, this is our first remote conference, so. Greetings, Your Excellency, and I'm a guest from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today, but I am happy to be able to share Pittsburgh's story. It's a story of public and private collaboration, of shared vision, and of perseverance. First, let me show you the view. Downtown Pittsburgh is nestled within three rivers, the Allegheny and the Monongahela, which flow together to form the Ohio. The Mon, as we call it, is one of the few navigable rivers in the world that flows from south to north. You might be able to think of another one. Well, like Cairo, Pittsburgh was born of its rivers. Way back in the 1750s, England and France even went to war over it. In America, we call it the French and Indian War. In Europe, it's known as the Seven Years' War. Either way, it was the First World War, fought to control the headwaters of the Ohio River, the gateway to the entire North American continent. After the war and later the American Revolution, immigrants began to pour into Pittsburgh from all over Europe on their way to settle the North American continent. Industry began to take hold to supply those settlers heading west. But it wasn't the rivers that made Pittsburgh one of the world's great industrial centers. It was coal, an entire mountain of coal. In fact, I'm standing on it. You know, actually, it may be easier to see from over here. Now, that hill I was standing on, uh, we call it Mount Washington, uh, named for America's first president. But for most of its history, it was called Coal Hill because of an enormous coal reserve underneath that hill. And it was the combination of that coal next to the river, next to pretty much the only flatland around here, that caused industry to take root in Pittsburgh. 
By the American Civil War in the 1860s, Pittsburgh was producing half the nation's iron and one-third of its glass. Along the way, the global oil and gas industry was born here. The same geology that created all that coal provided rich oil fields about 100 kilometers north of here. Pittsburghers drilled the world's first commercial oil well in 1859 and the first commercial natural gas well not long after. We have a long history in energy. We have a long history in manufacturing. In fact, during World War II, Pittsburgh's mills produced more steel than Germany and Japan combined. But we paid a terrible price for all that success. By the 1940s, our skies were choked with smoke and our rivers were full of industrial waste and raw sewage. Businessmen would bring an extra white shirt to work every day so they could change at lunchtime because their collars would have turned gray. Street lights burned 24 hours a day. Civic leaders were worried. They feared that without the stimulus of the war effort, Pittsburgh would not be able to compete. Nobody would want to live here. They'd have a hard time keeping the people they had and an even harder time attracting new people to Pittsburgh. So two great leaders came together, the Democratic mayor, David L. Lawrence, and the Republican financier, R.K. Mellon. They formed a committee for post-war planning and brought together business, government, nonprofit, and labor leaders. Together, they set four big priorities to improve Pittsburgh. Air quality, water quality, flood control, and urban redevelopment. And they created tools to help them solve those problems. One of those tools was the organization that I work for, the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, a private sector NGO created to work in partnership with government to improve the economy and the quality of life of Pittsburgh. Seventy years later, we're still at it. This great public-private partnership mobilized the community to clear the smoke, clean the rivers, stop the floods, and revitalize the urban core. Civic leaders first talked about building a park and a fountain at the point in 1944. They turned the fountain on in 1974. It took a generation, but Pittsburgh eventually became known as the most livable place in America. In the years since, we've had our share of crises. In the 1980s, our industrial base collapsed. 250,000 people moved away as the unemployment rate soared to 18%. The crisis forged new partnerships. Once again, public and private sector leaders came together this time not to improve Pittsburgh, but to save it. They retooled our existing industries, manufacturing, energy, and finance, and they invested through our colleges and universities in people who created entirely new industries in healthcare and information technology. And through it all, they continued to invest in making a better place. We made strategic investments in arts and culture, and later in outdoor recreation. The biking and hiking trails you see along the rivers didn't even exist 15 years ago. Today, Pittsburgh remains among America's most livable places, but now we have an economy that is creating opportunity for everyone who lives here and for people who want to come to work here. So what is there to learn from this story? Well, for one thing, the power of partnership, of public and private sector leaders coming together to create a better place. Also, the importance of a shared vision or goal. And finally, perseverance. It took a generation to remake Pittsburgh. This kind of thing does not happen overnight. But one thing to remember when you look at the skyline behind me, none of that just happened. People made it happen. And that's perhaps Pittsburgh's greatest lesson of all. Thank you for listening to our story. To meet us, coming to sit and listen, I think this is really a wonderful opportunity. It is the first time that I had to come with this mission and I don't know of many missions like this, but really he is the man which is now on the gate of Egypt to welcome the people and also to do the right thing in enhancing business, industry and investment. I pray for the God that he will continue to do his mission and also to be a great support for Walden, His Excellency. Thank you, Dr. Ismail, for all those uh, good words that uh, I really don't deserve. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, thank you, 
uh, for coming. I'm here, I'm addressing uh, the, uh, our American friends coming all the way from Pittsburgh. Some, thank you for coming to Egypt. It's for us uh, a great pleasure to welcome you in Cairo to show you our, uh, our country, our city. Um, I'm sorry, it is one of the hottest days of, uh, uh, of the year uh, today. This was not part of the program. I apologize. And uh, it is also a pleasure for us to explain to you uh, what has happened in Egypt uh, politically and economically during the last three years. Uh, so much has been uh, said in, in the Western press in general. Uh, that was misreported. As you can see, uh, Cairo is peaceful. I mean, there are no bloodshed in the streets and there are no street fights. Uh, yes, we went through a very, very difficult, uh, very difficult uh, times, a very difficult transition uh, from uh, what we considered as an autocratic rule and uh, uh, we've undergone uh, a revolution, in the real sense of the word, a revolution led by the youth, uh, aspiring at uh, a more democratic uh, uh, situation, aspiring at building uh, a free, uh, democratic, uh, secular, just uh, Egypt. And uh, as you have seen uh, by the picture, it was a really, a real popular movement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this pop popular movement or uh, this revolution was stolen, stolen by uh, extremists who used uh, a religious discourse uh, to uh, win the battle and win the elections, which uh, they did uh, uh, in June uh, 2012. But uh, Egyptians uh, refused to change their identity. Uh, Egypt has been, through its history, a land where uh, civilizations met and did not clash. Egypt is uh, a Muslim country, since the vast majority of its population is Muslim, but also a large uh, Christian minority uh, is Egyptians is Egyptian and lives in Egypt. Egypt is an Arab an Arab country, but it is also an African one. It is also a Mediterranean one. Egypt has been through 5,000, 6,000 years of history, opened to all kind of cultures, and Egyptians refused to change their identity and refused to, uh, to get closed uh, into uh, 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 bigotry and fanaticism. So Egyptians revolted again, as you've seen in the pictures, on the 30th of June uh, 2013, exactly uh, one year uh, since the Muslim brother took hold of or took government. And uh, they called for the army to interfere. Some of the US press, of the Western uh, media, described this as a coup d'etat, a military coup d'etat. Uh, I think political scientists, uh, objective political scientists, would call, would call this a popular coup d'etat. It is, by all means, a popular movement. A popular movement that has been confirmed at least three times since then. It has been uh, confirmed on the 26th of July 2013, that is, uh, when people took to the streets, several millions took to the streets to uh, support the roadmap that was proposed by the army, a roadmap divided uh, in three stages. The first stage aiming at uh, uh, proposing uh, a new constitution to the Egyptian people through a referendum. A second stage uh, 
where presidential elections will be held, and the third stage when parliamentary elections would be held. And people took to the streets on the 26th of July uh, 2013 to confirm that support and their agreement to the proposed roadmap. The support was reconfirmed the second time uh, when uh, uh, a large number of voters went to the polls to uh, approve the proposed uh, constitution. And the constitution was uh, 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 issued. And the third time, when 26 million uh, Egyptians went to the poll again and reconfirmed for the third time the popular movement that took place on the 30th of June to uh, vote and elect a new president of the republic. And there we are. We are on track on track uh, on that roadmap, but also on track to build the new Egypt, the democratic, free, secular, just uh, Egypt that the youth aspired to back on June, uh, back on December, sorry, on uh, January, on January 25th, uh, 2011. Uh, and we're adamant, we are going to continue because this is the will of the people and we'll do whatever is needed in order to reach our goals and uh, to build uh, our new Egypt. But to build this new Egypt, uh, we have to build a strong economy to uh, ensure the stability of this new Egypt we have to build a new economy and to face the huge, huge challenges and the huge problems that have been piling up through the years. We have problems, no doubt about it. Uh, we have a huge budget deficit that we need to solve and in order to solve it, we, need, we have to take very difficult decisions, sometimes painful decisions, but we have to take them. And we know it is not popular. We know uh, it will, it could have a negative popular reaction, but we have to be uh, true to ourselves. We have to be honest and we have to take those decisions and they will be taken. Uh, we have to uh, solve one of the main problems uh, that and obstacles uh, to the economic development of Egypt, which is, uh, unfortunately, the energy crunch we're currently facing. We're currently facing an energy crunch. The uh, production of oil and gas uh, today is insufficient to, uh, to, to uh, uh, I mean, it falls short uh, to cover the needs of the Egyptian economy, whether for industrial purposes or for household purposes. And we need, we have to solve this problem. Uh, we are currently designing uh, policies, policies aiming uh, at motivating people to get back to work, uh, aiming at giving incentives to people uh, to save, to invest, uh, to innovate, uh, to increase and improve their productivity and uh, their competitivity. We are designing uh, and, uh, policies and issuing new laws and reviewing existing ones uh, in order to amend it, in order to improve the investment climate uh, in Egypt, to attract investors, local, Arab, and foreign investors. And, uh, Egypt should be extremely attractive for foreign investments. Uh, the attraction is not only uh, uh, a market of 90 million consumers that uh, is in need of almost everything, but also uh, a country that is linked uh, with huge markets with free trade agreements. Uh, Egypt is linked to the EU, the European Union, with a free trade agreement. It is linked to the Eastern African countries through a free trade agreement called the COMESA. 
It is obviously linked uh, to uh, the Arab countries uh, through several uh, free trade agreements that allow uh, Egyptian products to get into that market uh, free of uh, uh, import duties, free of quotas. And all this is uh, definitely should uh, be attractive to uh, foreign investors. We are adamant, again, to try and create the proper environment to uh, have our economy uh, jumpstart again. And we're going to make it. We're going to make it because this is the will of the people, because this is the will of the government, and because every Egyptian, whether uh, in the rural areas or in the large cities, uh, knows that uh, he's facing a huge challenge and uh, I believe that he will be up to that challenge. Uh, we are looking uh, with optimism to the near future and uh, we hope uh, that we're going to succeed. Uh, to the American friends, let me tell you again that uh, we welcome you here. We welcome you uh, because we need to put, to put back on track uh, the relations uh, between the U.S. and Egypt that have unfortunately uh, gone off track, and I'll be very frank and very honest, uh, have gone off, off track uh, as a result of uh, a political position that your administration has taken uh, that has been extremely disappointing uh, to the Egyptians, to the Egyptian people, and to the Egyptian government. Uh, we are today, as Dr. Ismail uh, said, very correctly so, uh, fighting terrorism. We're fighting terrorism to safeguard our Egypt uh, from this threat, to safeguard the region, the Middle East, from this threat, to safeguard the Mediterranean countries from this threat, and to safeguard the world, as a matter of fact, from this threat. We're fighting today terrorism, and this is what we believe, and honestly believe, on behalf of the world. And we need the support of all the free-loving countries, the democratic countries, the uh, people who believe in equality, uh, and freedom between all the people. I'll stop right there. Thank you for coming to Egypt. I hope that you will be able to interact with your Egyptian counterparts. I hope you will be able to learn about uh, the huge possibilities that uh, the Egyptian market uh, can offer uh, to an investor, to a trader, to an importer, to an exporter. Uh, maybe I forgot to say that Egypt or our government uh, do believe in free trade. We think that open markets is a way to uh, acquire new technologies, to get to know new trends, to increase our competitivity uh, through uh, uh, dealing with uh, foreign markets. So again, let me welcome you. And I hope that uh, your meetings will be fruitful and will help uh, increasing uh, the confidence in the Egyptian economy and restoring the ties between Egypt and the U.S. of A. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciated that and we realized that. And uh, this mission has got also some people who are interested in helping in energy. Uh, we have Westinghouse for nuclear energy, we have uh, Eton for alternative energy, we have also for the prospect of uh, health insurance, we have the prospect of uh, the, the education, we have all this. Next time even, we'll have more and more, but uh, I'm sure that this formula is going to expand to have a great impact in the Egyptian and the American people as they work together without barriers. And uh, I look forward for that. Dr. Sorry, excuse me to interrupt. You have here uh, the ex-Minister of Petroleum, uh, who uh, is not only an oil man, 
We, we are honored by him today. And